Okay, I'd like to start by saying that UIT is proud to acknowledge the lands and people of the Mississaugas of Scugaga Island First Nation. We're situated on the traditional territory of the Mississaugas, a branch of the greater Anishinaabeg Nation, which includes Ojibwe, Odawa, and Potawatomi. Now we're going to have our okay. dean and then media. Okay, thank you. So I'm Peter Stute, the Dean of Social Science and Humanities. Um, relatively new here, so many new faces. Nice to meet you. Um, and this, is, of course, is the Legal Studies Distinguished uh, Visitor Lecture Series, the first talk of the year. So we're very pleased um, to have the commissioner here. I won't introduce him. I'll leave that to <coughs> Maria. But I did want to just mention quickly, um, those of you that aren't involved in legal studies, uh, from our website, Legal Studies examines laws defining features, forms, and functions, critically engages with how law interacts with and responds to social, political, and technological change. The program demonstrates a commitment to promoting justice by cultivating sensitivity uh, to diversity and exploring what it means to become an active, socially responsible <coughs> citizen. So we have a very strong mandate, I think, at the faculty, and it's one I'm very proud of and glad to contribute to. Uh, the questions about what are the responsibilities of the state um, and what are the limitations of the state in particular. I come from a political science background, so I'm these are questions that have been dogging me all my life. Um, this theme has animated um, political thought and philosophy since the age of Socrates. And we continue to struggle with it, perhaps even more so, in the digital age. Uh, so it's more timely than ever to discuss this age-old question, um, how we protect and balance access and uh, privacy rights as well. To introduce Commissioner Beamish, I'd, I'd like to call on Dr. Andrea Swain. Uh, who's not only one of our distinguished professors in legal studies here at the Faculty of Social Science and Humanities, uh, but is also currently serving as Associate Dean for Research Development. Welcome. I'm very pleased to welcome uh, Brian Beamish, the Information and Privacy Commissioner of Ontario, as our third guest uh, in the Legal Studies Distinguished Visitors Lecture Series, which we began last year. Uh, and as uh, Dean Stote mentioned, the first one for this year. Commissioner Beamish first began his career at the Office of the Information and Privacy Commissioner in 1999 as Director of Policy and Compliance. This followed by his, was, was followed by his appointment as Assistant Commissioner in 2005, where he directed the Tribunal Services Division, investigating privacy complaints and resolving access to information appeals. In addition to overseeing the tribunal, Brian also served as an executive policy advisor, playing a key role in ex executing the mandate of the IPC and supporting several initiatives in the best interests of the public, such as bringing universities and hospitals under the Freedom of Information and Protection of Privacy Act and ushering in the Personal Health Information Protection Act. Prior to joining the IPC, Brian held a number of positions within the Ontario Public Service including with the ministries of the Solicitor General and Correctional Services. He's a member of the Law Society of Ontario. For those of you that don't realize that that just changed, it used to be the Law Society of Upper Canada. We just changed our name like two weeks ago. So now it's the Law Society of Ontario. Um, and he's a graduate of the University of Toronto Law School, so we have that in common. <laughs> um, in 2016, he was a recipient of the Ontario Bar Association Karen Spector Memorial Award for Excellence in Privacy Law. Today he'll be speaking <coughs> to us on the topic of protecting and balancing access and privacy rights. So some of you I recognize from my uh, class in information and privacy law and so you will recall that the provincial commissioner shares the two hats of information access and privacy which is different at the federal level where it's two separate commissioners. Um, you'll also remember that the two mandates of access to information and privacy are very intertwined. And, uh, and that is both structurally and conceptually. And so I think Brian, um, Brian's talk is going to be uh, very relevant to those of you who have taken that class and those of you who haven't. It'll be a very nice introduction to this, uh, these two very important <coughs> Uh, fundamental democratic rights, which as he put it in, in an abstract that he sent me, may seem contradictory, but they're really two sides of the same coin that must both be protected and balanced to ensure government accountability, transparency, and privacy protection. So welcome, and I'm going to give the floor over to the commissioner, and then after that we'll open up the floor to questions. 
Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, thank you very much, uh, Dean and Andrea, uh, for the uh, introduction, uh, and the university for the invitation to participate here today. And it's very nice to see some friendly faces out there who uh, used to work for the uh, Information Privacy Commission. Uh, I am really flattered to be participating uh, here uh, and, and very thankful for the invitation. I did have a chance to, uh, to look at the, uh, the previous speakers in this series and uh, it, both of them have done and continue to do excellent work in the public good. So I'm, I'm really honored and flattered to be able to, uh, uh, to follow them. Uh, I did note, I looked at the, uh, the school agenda and I noticed I'm up against something called a long night against procrastination. <laughs> did, did you see that on the calendar? So I, I know many of you want, really want to get there, even putting it off, so I will try to, uh, uh, I will try to keep my remarks relatively short so you can, you can get there. Uh, when I uh, come out and speak, uh, I generally I'm, uh, I speak to, uh, to folks who work in the access and privacy area. I talk about the work that our office does, uh, current legislative initiatives, uh, guidance that, that, that we may be putting out that, that's helpful. But I thought I might take a, a, a little bit different approach uh, uh, this afternoon uh, and talk about, uh, as Andrea said, the, the interplay between uh, privacy on one hand, personal privacy, and, uh, and, and disclosure and access to information on, on the other hand. Uh, we do work, my office does work with what we consider to be two very fundamental issues, two fundamental principles for our democratic society. Uh, one is the idea that, that government will, will uh, be judicious in terms of how it collects information on its citizens and how it uses that information, and that it will, will uh, only use that information for recognized and acceptable goals, and also that government will be transparent about how it conducts its business, uh, how taxpayers' dollars are spent, how decisions are made, and that uh, ultimately uh, information doesn't belong to the government, but it belongs to all of us as citizens. Uh, those, are, those are sort of broad principles. There are nuances to it, but uh, uh, generally speaking, when, when we do our work at the IPC, we look at those of, as our two guiding, uh, guiding principles. Uh, I guess the question I'm going to pose to you and, and provide some examples for you to think about today is, are there occasions where those two principles may, may uh, be contradictory or collide? Uh, in other words, are there times where uh, a recognized right of an individual to privacy uh, may become subordinated to, to another principle or or to another, another uh, to disclosure, whether that's disclosure to the public in general or a, a segment of the public, uh, whether that's uh, for purposes of government transparency or uh, public or personal safety. When are those situations where uh, privacy may no longer be a, the, the principle that, uh, that takes the four? I'm really I'm pleased to talk about this because generally when I go out to talk I'm called the the privacy commissioner and uh, I always fight against that because we are also the information commissioner and the 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 uh, the principle of accountability and transparency uh, is is really important to us and plays a large role in the work we do so I'm in many ways putting on my information commissioner's hat here this afternoon and give you some scenarios and, and offer, or give you maybe some food for thought on when disclosure of information may be called for, even though it may infringe on an individual's privacy. I'll just give you a really quick overview of what our office does so you understand how and why we are engaged in this issue. Uh, we are, the I am, what's called an independent officer of the legislature, like the ombudsman or the provincial <laughs> auditor. Uh, the office is established to, uh, to be uh, independent of the government of the day so that the decisions we make are, are, are uh, not influenced by, uh, by uh, political reasoning uh, uh, or political influence. I report to the Legislative Assembly, not to the government, uh, just to keep that division between uh, independent decision makers and government influence uh, clear. We have uh, three pieces of legislation that we're responsible for. Uh, the first two are, are, are pretty much identical. Uh, 
That's the Provincial Freedom of Information and Protection of Privacy Act and its municipal counterpart. Uh, and those two acts establish the, on one hand, the, the public's right to privacy and sets the rules for what governments can do at the municipal and provincial level in terms of collection, use, and disclosure of information. And on the other hand, they also set the rules for disclosure of information by government. So they, they establish the rules for when government must disclose when requested information that, that it holds. Uh, the third act uh, is, is the, our Health Privacy Act, uh, which is, I would view, strictly a, a privacy piece of legislation uh, and sets the rules for the health community, healthcare community, uh, organizations or individuals providing health care uh, and what they can do in terms of the collection, use, and disclosure of all of our uh, health information. Just as a, as a footnote, our mandate will be expanding. Uh, the government recently passed amendments to the Child, Youth, and Family Services Act, which will extend access and privacy rights to individuals who are in that system. Uh, that would be primarily children's aid societies and, uh, and service providers for children's aid societies. Up until now, there was no right to privacy uh, in the children's aid system. And people in the system did not have a right to their file, did not have a legislated right to their file, uh, and that will now change. Uh, we also, the government recently passed an anti-racism act, uh, which will, uh, among other things, require or mandate the collection of race-based data. Um, I realized that this is an interesting issue uh, given the, the top, my topic. Uh, since race-based data clearly can be very, very sensitive. Generally speaking, uh, governments would not collect that, uh, but this piece of legislation will mandate that. So that's, uh, I thought, an interesting, uh, interesting footnote. Uh, so what do we do and why, why is the IPC involved in this? Well, on one hand, we do process ac access to information appeals. So if a member of the public asks that a ministry or a municipality for information and don't like the response they get, they can come to our office, and we can conduct an investigation, and at the end of the day, issue an order. We can require, among other things, the disclosure of information, uh, the reduction of fees, uh, a, a large number of things. So often we will be faced with a situation where somebody is asking for information which may contain someone else's personal information. And we are in the situation of determining whether that information should be disclosed. So that's the access side on the, the uh, uh, privacy side, members of the public have the right to come to us and file a complaint to say they believe that the government has misused their information uh, or has disclosed it improperly. So we will be on, uh, at times, uh, deciding whether the disclosure of personal information was done appropriately. So the, this issue of when it's appropriate for, for information, personal information to be disclosed is one that we deal with on a regular basis, either as a result of a privacy complaint or uh, within the access to information uh, regime. Just wanted to emphasize the, the, uh, the, uh, import, the importance of access and privacy uh, and how it's been recognized by the courts as important uh, fundamental principles. And given that this is a law-based class, I thought I would pull some quotes from the uh, Supreme Court of Canada. Uh, this one from uh, the Chief Justice who talked about and recognized that access to information and privacy are, are uh, requirements for a functioning uh, democracy. In each of those principles, privacy and access have been recognized by the courts. Uh, uh, privacy, for example, has been called a quasi-constitutional right. Uh, I'm not sure the difference between a constitutional right and a quasi-constitutional right, but it still sounds um, uh, important. Uh, and interestingly enough, in this case uh, from Duez, uh, the court did two things. One is that it uh, recognized the role of privacy in terms of physical and moral autonomy, but it also recognized that that, that role is becoming more and more important as we move into, uh, into our digital society. Uh, similarly, access to information has been been recognized by the Supreme Court as a, one of those pillars of our democracy. Uh, Off-quoted uh, 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 sentence from uh, Justice Lafaure that its, uh, its overarching purpose is to facilitate democracy. Uh, another quote I like to give is from uh, uh, Ian Scott, who was the Attorney General in Ontario when our FOI legislation came into effect. Uh, and he said, uh, 
Uh, we do not now and never will accept the proposition that the business of the public is none of the public's business. And I think that gets to the key of why we think access to information is important. That it's not the government's information, uh, it's the public's information. Uh, so let's, before I get into, into the, the, uh, I this interplay between uh, privacy and, and, and uh, disclosure, I want to just talk a little bit about, pri uh, start with privacy and why it's important. In our laws, Ontario's laws, as I've said, set the rules for collection, use, and disclosure of personal information. They set the boundaries, and, and that's based on the idea that, that the government is the steward of our information, not the owners. And I think that's important to recognize, particularly in the government context, because often in, with government, the collection of our personal information is not based on consent. We, ha we don't have a choice about filing our income tax return. We don't have a choice about our employers sending our income tax information to, uh, 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 to, the, to a government. If we want to apply for, uh, for certain goods or, or services, uh, like a student loan, we have to provide personal information. This is not based on consent. This is a, a, a requirement. So I think that places a huge responsibility on government to ensure that their, that their collection and their use of that information is being done responsibly. And I realize, and we realize, when we, we try to look at this issue of when personal information uh, should be made public, we, we, we has, have that as our backdrop that in many cases this information has been collected without consent and there is a huge responsibility to ensure that to the extent that it is used or disclosed that it's been done responsibly. Uh, that said, uh, our law does recognize uh, and generally I, I think privacy laws uh, across Canada and, and uh, in the world recognize that privacy is not an absolute and that, uh, that there are times where the disclosure of personal information is either uh, 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 within discretion of government or is required by government. And I, I thought I would, uh, would start by giving you some examples directly from, from our acts and from, from the Ontario experience uh, of where this kicks in. Uh, one is starting with, with what we call the personal privacy exemption itself. Uh, if I put in a, an FOI request for uh, information belonging to uh, Andrea, the government generally it will refuse that based on what's called the personal privacy exemption. But that exemption I is not uh, absolute. It says that that disclosure should not happen if that disclosure would be an unjustified invasion of Andrea's privacy, which I would suggest uh, recognizes that there will be justified invasions of, uh, of her privacy. As well, uh, privacy legislation in Ontario and elsewhere contains the concept of the public interest. In, in the Ontario legislation, it's the public interest override. So even though an exemption could be applied to deny access to information, if there's a greater public interest in the disclosure of that information, it can be disclosed. Uh, and one of the exemptions that, that can be overridden is the personal privacy exemption. So there will be cases, and, and I'll provide one later, where even though the disclosure of information would be a, a, an unjustified invasion of someone's personal privacy, there is a greater public good in the disclosure of that information. Uh, again, uh, some examples from Ontario and Ontario legislation. Uh, we have a sunshine list. I've had one since the mid-90s, I believe. Uh, and up until the mid-90s, the salaries of public servants was not disclosable. But a policy decision was made uh, that if you made a certain amount of money, not only was your salary disclosable, but there had to be proactive disclosure of that salary. And I, I think that's supportable on the basis of accountability for, for uh, public spending, how public funds are expended, uh, public servant salaries, Re represent a huge uh, 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 percentage of government spending. And I think it's fair to say that at a certain level, uh, your interest in privacy and what you earn should be subservient to the public's right to know uh, what you're making as a public servant. It, part of the price of being a public servant, I guess. Uh, similarly, it, it, there has been a change over the years in terms of how, uh, how travel expenses are dealt with. Uh, when I first uh, 
became the assistant commissioner for tribunal back in 2005, we were still dealing with access to information requests where someone wanted to know what, C, what are the travel expenses of the uh, president of, uh, of, for example, this university. And often the, the government organization would resist disclosure on the basis that that would be an invasion of the president's privacy. That's his personal information. Well, we've come a long way since then. And I think it's recognized now that if you're a public servant and you're, you're traveling or you're, you're providing hospitality, you're spending public money and there needs to be transparency about that. In Ontario, we now have uh, proactive disclosure. If you're, if you're a senior public servant, your, your, your travel expenses and hospitality expenses must be uh, posted on a website. Uh, I think it's uh, every quarter. So we've come a long way in terms of deciding, well, let's not worry about whether someone's name's attached to that. Let's ask the question, is that information the public has a right to know? A couple of, two more quick examples. Uh, Privacy legislation pretty much universally recognizes there will be situations, emergency situations, where the disclosure of personal information is acceptable uh, if it's to protect the health and safety of an individual or individuals. And uh, I think most of us would agree that uh, privacy should not trump uh, disclosure if it's to, uh, if it's to provide, uh, if it's, if it's uh, based on the safety or protecting the safety of an individual. And I think we can think of situations where uh, uh, there will be a public disclosure of information of someone who has gone missing, for example, uh, uh, someone's wandered off and, and, uh, and maybe an Alzheimer's victim, and there will be a public disclosure of this person uh, description, uh, 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 and, and although that's very personal information, uh, there is a, a greater good in, in, the, in the safety of that individual. The other interesting example is, is in Ontario, which is unique to the Ontario piece of legislation, is what's called compassionate circumstances. Uh, in the past, and in general, a, 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 an individual's privacy is their own. And we had situations that arose where an individual would die, sometimes under uh, suspicious circumstances or, or unclear circumstances, and the family would want, the police would come in and do an investigation and the family would want to have access to the file, to the investigation file, to find out what happened to their loved one. Why did they die? Was it suicide? Was it an accident? Uh, uh, what just, they wanted the details. And often they would say they really needed that for closure. Well, our law treated them as if they were just a separate third party. It did not give them any particular standing to get that information. And uh, uh, because of the advoc advocacy of our office, there was a change in the law about 10 years ago that said family, recognize that families have a right. It's a compassionate right to information if they have a, a loved one who's deceased. It, access to the information that would allow them to understand what happened. And that has been a very effective amendment. And now the police generally are very good at, at sitting families down and going through files and disclosing the information so they can have an understanding of uh, of, uh, of, of the circumstances of the death. Uh, now, uh, interestingly enough, the attitudes on this, this uh, tension between disclosure and, and personal privacy does have some jurisdictional or, or even cultural differences. Now, does anybody recognize who this guy is? Gandalf? No, come on. <laughs> this, uh, this, I think his name is Dr. Bernstein, and he got in the news about a year or so ago because he was the then pre uh, candidate Trump's doctor, personal doctor. And you re re may remember that he released a, a letter publicly saying that, that if, if Mr. Trump became president, he would be the most healthiest president ever. Do, do I, this is not ringing any bells. Anyway, it was on the late night, uh, late night shows, had a lot of fun with it, and, and he sort of came across as super, you know, this, this uh, hippie doctor from, uh, from California, and uh, it, was, it was very humorous. But I thought it pointed to an underlying reality, which is in the United States, if you're a candidate for presidency, it's expected that you will release a detailed itemization of your health. This, uh, this doctor, the, 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 the humor here was that it was such a, it was a one page, he'll be the healthiest person ever. Uh, whereas candidates in the past do release very detailed uh, 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 accounting for their health situation. Uh, Hillary Clinton did it, uh, Obama did it, uh, presidents uh, throughout. It's become public expectation that if you're running for that office, 
you are clear to the public about how, what your health is. That contrasts a lot with Canada. Uh, that just is not an expectation in Canada that, that politicians in running for office would release statements about their health. They're, they're, I think in Canada we view that as, as very personal information. Unlike the states, we would say that's unrelated to their desire to, to be elected. Americans would say that's directly related to their desire to be elected. We have a right to know uh, if that candidate is going to be able to complete their term or not. But very different attitudes uh, uh, towards that. And I, I, Interestingly, I read last week about a federal minister who underwent uh, uh, emergency surgery in Canada and there is no, nothing public about what that surgery was, uh, the, the outcome of the surgery, other than it was successful, uh, what, the, what the prognosis was. Much different from the American situation. I mean, we can think of John McCain, who uh, underwent uh, treatment for cancer. CNN uh, uh, would have very detailed information about what the surgery was, what the prognosis was. Uh, quite a different, uh, a, quite a different uh, a political culture and attitude in terms of that division between privacy and, and what's public information. A very similar uh, uh, example of that difference between Canada and the United States, I think, goes into something what's called public records. Uh, and this example is sex offender registries, where in most states, the sex offender registry is a public record. So everyone has the right, members of the public can go into the state sex offender registry and, and, and see who's in there. Um, and the basis of that is, is the, the view that the public has a right to know where sex offenders are living and uh, that uh, uh, that's information that should be in the public sphere. We have quite a different approach in Canada. Uh, in Ontario, sex offender registry similar to other provinces. It's a police only registry. Uh, it's not a public registry, and, and we've made the decision here that the public does not need to know where sex offenders are, are living. The purpose of that is that police can have a record of where their addresses are. It's not to provide the public uh, the ability to go in, and we have concerns about vigilantism and, and, uh, and, and issues like that that lead to that position. Uh, but this, this divide between Canada and the United States, I think, is, is quite marked. Uh, the, the American approach, from my experience, tends to be not, is that personal information and should it be disclosed? It's, is that a public record? Was it created through public funding? And if it is, the default is it, it's, it should be available to the public. Uh, and that, uh, that goes for, for uh, law enforcement records, uh, any other ki many kinds of records that in Canada we would, we would not have disclosed. Uh, uh, I thought of... Uh, the situation back uh, a couple of months ago, the unfortunate situation of a nurse in, in Colorado who was arrested for refusing to allow the police to take a blood sample from her, her patient. Don't know if you saw that. Uh, and the publicly released was the body cam of that, of what happened. So the public had the right to see, to see what happened to her and it was, it was, uh, it was awful. But that type of disclosure would be very, very unlikely, uh, unlikely here. I thought I, I, I was looking around for other examples, and I thought this was a, a really good one and, and a surprising one. Did you know that in, in Finland and, and Norway and Sweden, tax returns are public documents? Everyone's tax return is public. And, and uh, uh, th this, uh, this uh, report from uh, Reuters, uh, uh, you, calls it, uh, in Finland it's called National Envy Day, the day that everyone's tax releases are, uh, are, uh, are disclosed, or, or uh, calling it uh, financial porn, but I think this is a really interesting concept. Uh, that is the opposite of how, how tax returns are treated in almost every other country. Uh, and in looking at why that is, uh, the, the Scandinavian or the Nordic uh, approach seems to be we live in a social state, uh, it's important that people pay their, as citizens, uh, pay, uh, do their duty and pay their, 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 uh, their fair share of this. And one way of doing this is to, uh, is to uh, make their uh, tax returns disclosable. In Sweden, uh, according to this report, a single anonymous telephone call to a tax authority is enough to find out what someone has paid. So it's a, a, a very different approach sometimes on, on specific issues to privacy and disclosure. One final example, uh, and this is, a, I found, again, an interesting one. Uh, 
Access Info Europe is an is a, a, a NGO supporting access and transparency in Europe. And they have had a long-standing uh, issue with the uh, European Commission trying to get the European Commission to disclose the expenses, travel expenses of European commissioners. And you would think this would be a given. The European Commission is, a, is, a, is this massive, sophisticated uh, body that you would think disclosure of, of commissioners' travel expenses would, be, would, 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 would happen. It's not the case. Uh, Access Europe has, has, been, has spent years trying to get disclosure of this information. So the, as you move your way through different jurisdictions or different cultures, you'll see that the, that line of where personal information should uh, be disclosed does move. So let me move, move to some other examples. And, and, and uh, I guess my question to you is, where would you fall on the spectrum of this? Uh, one issue that has, has uh, occurred or, or risen continually in uh, Ontario uh, is the disclosure of what's called Special Investigation Unit reports. The SIU is called in whenever there's a, an incident involving police. Uh, if there's a police shooting, for example, the SIU comes in and does an investigation. Uh, and and this, this particular news report was, was about uh, Andrew Loku, who was, uh, died as a result of a police shooting. But the, the general issue is that those reports are not disclosed. And not only are they not disclosed publicly, but they're not even disclosed to the family. So in this particular case, Mr. Loku's family could not even get a copy of the report or a copy of the redacted report to try to understand why charges were not brought against the officer. And this, this raised a, a lot of consternation. Uh, the, the, the particular case here, the Attorney General came out and said that she was prevented by provincial privacy law from disclosing that, and, and I had to go on the record to say that's not the case, that she had the discretion to disclose it and could disclose it if she wanted to. And in fact, there were very good reasons why she might want to disclose it. Uh, the, the result of this was that uh, Mr. Justice Michael Tullock was appointed to do a review. He came back with, with recommendations uh, to bring greater transparency to this area of SIU reports. And his recommendation was, he recognized that there need to be far, far greater uh, 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 transparency. Uh, his recommendation was the reports be released, but that the name of the officer involved be redacted. Now, I, th I thought that was an interesting uh, conclusion for him. Uh, and, and, and the government introduced amendments to the uh, Police Services Act last week, I believe, or the week before, putting this into effect. But I think a case could be made that in, in terms of accountability and transparency, that, that there will be instances where the officer's name should be released. Uh, and I think, I think I, I'm not second-guessing uh, uh, Justice Tullock. He did his review. and. Uh, and came to the conclusion that transparency didn't require that. Uh, but I, I think we could all think of circumstances where, in fact, uh, the, the, the responsibility and the power given to a police officer uh, comes with the concept that if you are involved in, in an altercation with the public, uh, that will become public, including uh, the fact that you are the one involved. Uh, I, I, Another example I wanted to give you was the, uh, the, uh, a case involving a, a young student at Carleton named uh, Nadia Kujuji. Uh, this goes back about five, uh, seven or eight years, perhaps. And uh, Ms. Kujuji had been seeing a counselor on campus at Carleton. Uh, she had, she had been, been re had, uh, receiving uh, uh, medication for depression. And uh, Despite the fact that they knew, the staff at the counseling office knew she was suicidal, they did not contact her family. And, and unfortunately, she did commit suicide. Now, when, when questioned about that, the university said, we did not have the ability, we did not have the authority to disclose her information to her family because of, of privacy laws. Now, uh, I think I noted earlier that, in fact, that's wrong, that if you read our law, it, it clearly says that information can be disclosed if it's to, uh, to avoid harm to, a, to an individual. Uh, so they definitely did have that discretion. Uh, and I don't know whether this was a case of the university sort of uh, justifying their action in, in retrospect and saying, well, the privacy law prevented us, or if this was simply an oversight on their part. But, uh, I think this is an example of where disclosure may not be to the general public, uh, 
but there are cases where disclosure to a segment of the public, a, uh, a targeted segment of the public, is quite justified. I think the interesting question on this one is, what if Nadia had said to the staff specifically, I do not want you telling my family? Uh, that didn't happen in this case. She was silent. But I'm not sure. I, I think that might change the situation. I'm not sure. But if, if, if being, of, of, uh, being a, an adult uh, and saying to the, to the clinic, I know that, that my family would want to know, but I tell you, do not do it. Does that change the situation? It, it puts the staff in a, very, in a difficult bind because they have very clear instructions on one hand, but they also know that disclosure may, in fact, uh, assist the person on the other. Uh, this is a, uh, uh, another unfortunate example of how there can be misconceptions in terms of the, uh, the need to protect privacy rather than disclose it. Uh, and and un unfortunately has arisen all too often in the children's aid uh, sector. Uh, this particular one was a, a young man, young boy named uh, Jeffrey Baldwin, uh, who died uh, while he was in the care of his, uh, his grandparents. And it became pretty clear during the inquest that various children's aid societies and various actors in the area had information that could have prevented this. They had information about the grandparents that could have prevented uh, uh, this from happening. But that was not shared. And and a, again, privacy was presented as the barrier to, to sharing this information. Uh, and again, uh, I, I would suggest to you that this is a misunderstanding of our privacy laws. That clearly there was the ability not to make it public, but to share within the, within the, the child care uh, community itself information that would, would prevent this type of, uh, type of tragic death. Uh, and in fact, as a result of that, uh, we worked with uh, what's called the Provincial Advocate for Children and Youth, who's also an a, uh, independent officer of the legislature, to put out a document or uh, a publication to the child care community to say, privacy is not a does not prevent you from disclosing and sharing information about children who, uh, who may be in need of care, uh, trying to dispel that myth that, uh, uh, that privacy in this area is an absolute. Uh, I, going to just quickly skip over to a couple more. This was a, a case that I found personally really fascinating that came out this summer. Generally speaking, I think the practice in Ontario is if a, an individual is a victim of a homicide, their identity is released by the police. And uh, from my point of view, there are very good reasons for that. I, I think that that's, there's a, a true public interest in knowing uh, who, who victims of violence are, particularly victims of, uh, of homicides. But a, a couple of months ago, the Alberta Association of Chiefs of Police put out a new policy in this area. And that policy was that, generally speaking, uh, the identity of homicide victims will not be disclosed and would only be disclosed if there was, uh, if there was a reason to pr uh, rebut this presumption of, uh, of non-disclosure. Uh, and, and I guess in my mind, I find this misguided because it, it, it frames the identification of homicide victims as a privacy issue. And uh, I, I, I just don't see it that way. I, under, I see it more as an issue of transparency. And the community's right to know. Uh, fortunately, homicide is, is, is relatively infrequent in our society. But I think there is, a, my, in my view, there is a general public interest in knowing who has been victims of homicide. Uh, but uh, I, I, I understand where there may be varying, uh, uh, varying opinions on that. Uh, finally, uh, just in terms of examples, uh, this is an example of or a situation of uh, disclosure to the general public. Uh, but we run into, uh, into situations where an individual's right to privacy has been, has been violated. And uh, for example, in the health sector, a, a patient may discover that hospital staff have gone into their file uh, in inappropriately. So generally speaking, hospital staff can access electronic files if they're providing care to a patient. But it happens that, that, that staff will go in either out of curiosity, uh, out of idleness, uh, uh, it may be uh, an ex-partner or what have you, they'll go in and take a look at a, at a file, and, 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 and that'll be discovered. Uh, 
uh, in our view, uh, not only should the person who's, I call it the victim, the person whose file has been looked at, has a right to know that that happened, but we also believe they have a right to know who looked at their file. And, and I guess maybe a little bit more controversially, what was the result of any discipline? Was there discipline and what was the result of that discipline? Now I think generally speaking, there's a recognition that the person has a right to know who looked at their file, but there has been some controversy in, in privacy era circles about going the step further. And initially many hospitals would simply say, we took appropriate action. And we've taken the position, that's not good enough to say we've taken appropriate action. What does that mean? If, if a person's file has been violated, we believe that part of, uh, of making them whole again is letting them know who looked at their file and what was the discipline that was, was, uh, was meted out. Uh, I recognize there are no constraints on the person having, having learned that to go public with it, uh, but I, I, in our mind, their interest in knowing what happened in the situation should take precedence over the whatever limited privacy interest the, uh, the violator of, of the file had. But as I say, that's not necessarily universally accepted uh, uh, in our sector. I'm just going to jump ahead and uh, just talk about some steps about enhancing transparency. Uh, and and this, this is, these are examples of enhancing transparency uh, even though there may be personal information involved. Uh, we work, uh, as, I, as I mentioned, uh, a, a focus of our work is on government transparency. We do a lot of work in trying to get proactive disclosure of government information. For example, contracts, uh, they may not contain personal information, but we work hard to try to get proactive disclosure of those. But we do uh, have, have uh, issued orders that have required contracts of consultants so identifiable individuals and what their per diems are, we've ordered those disclosed. Uh, we have uh, issued orders disclosing employment contracts. For example, uh, we have a series of orders dealing with chiefs of police where the local media have wanted to know what's the contract that the, of the chief of police. Uh, severance payments. Uh, we've ordered severance payments of public servants disclosed. Again, based on this idea that if tax money is being spent, the public has the right to know how it's being spent. I thought that the, uh, the university CEOs was an, is an interesting example of, of how to and how not to respond to FOI requests. Uh, universities came under the act in 2006 uh, and I think January 1. January 2, uh, somebody in the uh, Hamilton area put in an FOI request for the uh, McMaster president's uh, contract, or CEO's contract. They denied access saying it was uh, personal information. Uh, it contained a salary and a lot of benefits. Uh, university CEOs have some nice benefits that uh, uh, information and privacy commissioners don't have, but leaving that aside. Uh, uh, in any event, at the end of the day, uh, I, I, I did this personally and I ordered, uh, ordered it out on the basis that this is public money, people have a right to see what the, what the, uh, the uh, CEO is getting. And it got a fair bit of publicity in the Hamilton area, not just about what the content of the contract was, but the fact that the university wouldn't disclose it. And every time there was a, a step in the, FO, in the appeal process, there was a little article in the Hamilton paper about, well, here's this, they're still not giving out that contract. University presidents, though, did a smart, that's how not to handle it, because it generated more news about not giving it out than the actual content of the contract. Uh, after that order was released, on a particular day, every other university president in Ontario released their contract proactively. And there was no news story. Uh, there was a news story saying, here's how much they made, but there was a one-day story. It went away. And though that's how to, I thought it was an interesting example of how to, uh, how to respond. Anyway, I'm going to wrap up. Before I wrap up, I do want to talk about OHIP billings. Uh, this is a, a case that we have been involved in uh, deeply. Uh, Toronto Star put in an FOI request for the top 100 OHIP billers in the province. Uh, the Ministry of Health denied that based on uh, the privacy of the doctors involved. And I have to say, in fairness to the Ministry, they were following our precedent in that. We had issued an order back in the 1990s saying that OHIP billings were personal information of the doctors. We took a fresh look at this case. Uh, change in Commissioner may have had something to do with that. Uh, but we, we, we changed our position. And we said, no, 
Uh, number one, OHIP billings are not personal. They're, they're business. They're, the doctor's making that because that's their business. Not their, not their, it's not personal information. But even if it was personal information, there's a greater right of the public to have access to that. Uh, health spending in the provinces is, is, is large. OHIP billings make up a big segment of that, and the public has a right to see how, that, uh, how those dollars are being spent. Uh, that case uh, was appealed to divisional court where we were successful, and uh, we got a very strong decision from the Ontario divisional, from the divisional court. It's now at the, the uh, uh, Ontario Medical Association has sought leave to appeal to the, uh, the Ontario Court of Appeal, and, and that's still outstanding. I said one more slide, but I, I wanted to give you, let me wrap up on this. Uh, before I go into my wrap up, one of the most <laughs> one of the most difficult issues for us to deal with are situations where uh, there is an accusation of wrongdoing uh, against a public servant, and we deal in the public sector, so I, I, this could happen in the private sector as well. But in, in there's an accusation of wrongdoing that may be uh, uh, financial mismanagement, it may be conflict of interest, it may be harassment in the workplace. And the, the, uh, the, the government organization involved goes in and does a, a study. Either they do it themselves, they do an investigation, or they have a consultant company come in and do an investigation, and they have a report as a result of it. And either someone wants an access to that report to see what's in it, or the organization itself wants to release it. They want to show the public, not only did we act properly, we want to prove to you that we acted properly, and we want to disclose that report. And quite often those reports, because of the nature of the allegation, will have very, very sensitive information and damaging information to, uh, to an individual's uh, uh, reputation if the allegation is, uh, is, is uh, upheld by the investigation. So it does raise the question, uh, should, that, should that report be made public? And we have, we have dealt with that uh, on a number of occasions. Increasingly we're dealing with it. And increasingly, it's the organization itself that wants to release the report to show the public that we have done a proper investigation and taken the proper steps. The one in example I'm giving here is, is uh, a situation at Algoma Public Health where there was an allegation of impropriety uh, to the, uh, the uh, CEO in terms of conflict of interest and hiring and, and uh, financial mismanagement. Uh, a, a consulting firm came in and did, a, did an investigation and, and verified some of those. And public health, Algoma Public Health itself made the decision that they would disclose that report publicly as a result of an FOI request from the local media. One of the individuals involved, who is the subject of the investigation, objected and appealed to our office, and we upheld the, the Algoma Public Health decision based on that public interest override, that even though this is really sensitive information and a, that there is a public interest in, in people knowing People in Algoma, this was a, a big issue in Sault Ste. Marie, was in the paper uh, continuously. They had a right to see what the results of that investigation was, and they had a right to know that Algoma Public Health had taken the proper steps and had taken this, uh, uh, this seriously. But this is, I think, an example of where that, the, the, the harder example, the hardest examples of where that intersection between privacy and, uh, and public disclosure uh, can come into play. So I said that was it, that will be it. Uh, other than to say, so what do we do about it? And uh, we have said, and we, I believe that our acts are way out of date. Uh, the, the, the Provincial Freedom of Information Protection of Privacy Act came into effect in 1987. So it is, it's 30 years old. It was, it, it, it was based in a different world. And, and I think it was based in a time of different public expectations. Uh, so we have, we, there, in terms of this, this, this connection, this intersection between privacy and, uh, and uh, uh, disclosure, uh, if anyone has had the misfortune to have to work through the privacy provisions of the Act uh, and how they intersect with access, it's not easy. And I think they really need a review. And I think sometimes rather than ask, is this personal information and that be the end of the issue, the question is, is this information the public has a right to see? And let's start there and then decide as, as this first question, not, worry, not get caught up on whether we're going to call this business information or personal information or what have you. Let's ask, is, this, is, is, is there a public right to know here? I think there should be positive duties of disclosure built into the acts, uh, not only when it comes to personal information, but other types of government information. Uh, 
There should be information that people shouldn't have to ask for. It should be clear that it must be disclosed. Uh, Justice Tullock's report I mentioned on the SIU is a good example where he said there should be a, there should be a duty to disclose this information. And I, I do think that when we work our way through what, what I call the public interest override, uh, it could be broadened. I think right now its application is fairly narrow. I think it, uh, it could be, I think public, the public expectation of what the public interest is has increased, and, and I don't think the act has caught up. Anyway, with that, I want to thank you for your attention. Uh, I thank uh, Andrea and the university again for the invitation to participate, and I'm happy to take questions not only on this, but uh, on anything that we do. Thank you very much.